Hello, how are you, dear student? This is Professor Carver, and today we are going to talk about the cell structures and functions. So let's go. Cell structures and functions. So let's start with some history, right? Let's give credit to those people that um, discover cell and the cell structures and all discover the cell functions. 1609, Galileo Galilei develops a compound microscope with a concave and convex lens. That's for our first microscopy. Rubik Hall, he published micrographia. And he's the first one that used the cell as name. Cell in Latino means a compartment, a little house. And when he was looking under the microscopy that has been developed by Galileo, uh, he was looking at the the cor uh, he was looking at the cork, and he was like, "Oh, such a beautiful cellulia, which is a cell." Sixteen hundred. Using hand graft microscopy, observe a described single celled organism which he called anima killis. And today we call it microorganism. It's an organism that we can look under microscopy. It's a microorganism. Mid 1800, Schwann observed, he's the first one that observed the cell animals. And Verschu. Verschu is the first one that studied that the predictions of a cell came from a pre-existing cell. So coming all this together, we come up with the cell theory. What the cell theory said, stated that all organisms are made from one or more cells. The cell is the simple's basic unit of structure, and function is the basic unit of life. And all the cells arise from pre-existing cells. How we study those cells? Not all the cells are visible um, to our uh, to the naked eye. We have to use. I mean, uh, most of the cells they are less than 50 micrometers in diameter, so we cannot see them with the naked eyes. We need a, a very specific tools to look at them, microscope. So let, let, let's see how we can see with our eyes. You can see the human, you can see some chicken eggs, you can see some frog eggs, you can see even some human egg, but you cannot see, for example, the structure that is inside. You cannot see, for example, this little organelle that exists in the cell. Remember the hierarchical level of organization. The cells are made of organelles, and organelles are made of molecules, and molecules are made of atoms, and atoms are made of the three particles, neutron, electrons, and proton. So I do it in the reverse way. Electrons, neutrons, protons make atom. Atom chemistry make molecules. And molecules, this is what make those organelles, like mitochondria, for example. All right? And those organelles come in together, mitochondria with another organelle, with another organ, and they make a cell, like animal cells, plant cells, all right? So this, we can see, the light microscopy can see between one millimeters, if you see, up to 100 nanometers, which is really, really very little. You remember, we went through a lab microscopy, and we know that the light microscopy has a limit. It can magnify it up to 1,000 times because it have one of the highest objective is 100x and the ocular is 10x. So therefore, it's magnified anything we are seeing under microscopy to 1,000 times. Less than 100 nanometers, we cannot see it under microscopy. Like for example, the microscopy, like we cannot see some protein, some lipids, 
So we use a different um, a kind of microscope, which is an electronic microscopy that doesn't use a light um, as a beam, but use electron. So the light microscopy, visible light, if you remember our lab, passes it through a specimen and uh, through a glass lenses which magnified with the objective will magnify this specimen and the quality of the image will depend on magnifications the ratio of an object uh, image size to his real size also depend on the resolutions which is the clarity of the image the capacity of the, the separate two point in the space and also on the contrast. Sometimes um, this is how the specimen can stand out against the background. And sometimes, um, look for example, look at this. This is unstained cell. This is just <coughs> an epidermal buccal cells that you take from your mouth and you put it in the slide. And when you look at it in the microscope, I mean, this is with no staining. Once you increase the contrast by staining with the blue to uh, uh, methylene, for example, if we color the nucleus darker blue, you can see the cells very, very well. You can see the structure. You can see that this is plasma membrane, cytoplasm, and this is the nucleus for the cell. So the contrast. It's how the specimen stand out against the background. Here it was very, very hard. You have really to be a professional to look at that this is my nucleus over here. And this is the plasma. It's very hard. But when I do a staining using a specific dye, well, I can see that my cell is standing out against the background. Okay, the other type of microscopy, it's electronic microscope. The electronic microscopy use a beam of electrons that will provide an image that looks like a 3D image. And electronic microscopy, the, ad the advantage, you can look at the ultra structures of the cell. For the light microscopy, it's very limited. I cannot look at the ultrastructures. I can look at the nucleus. I can look at the cytoplasm, but I need a specific staining for those. And the advantage of light microscopy is I didn't have to fix my cell. I can, for example, me as a scientist, I have a cells that I am growing in my lab. I have a specific incubators. I put my cells there. And at time to times, I have to look at them and see if I have to change the media of the cells. I keep them alive. I keep my cells alive. And they can look at it under a light microscopy. I cannot do that with the electronic microscopy. To um, uh, look at my cells under uh, uh, electronic microscopy, I need to fix them. In another word, I, with alcohol, for example, I need to fix them. In another world, the cells are not going to stay lively. They are no longer alive. Once you put alcohol in the cells, it's no longer alive. When you put um, paraformaldehyde, you fix it. You, the fixator, you use a specific fixator to conserve the structures of the cells, but the cell is no longer alive. Light microscopy, I can do both. I can look at fixed cells, that no longer alive, but I can keep my cells alive and look at it under microscopy. So I look at under microscopy, look at my cells, are they needing uh, to change the media, are they infected, contaminated, um, did I have uh, uh, to uh, subculter them, etc., etc. But electronic microscopy, the cells, that's a really the biggest difference between uh, uh, the advantage, the disadvantage of the electronic microscopy that the cells are no longer staying alive. Okay, 
So we have two types of uh, electronic microscopy. We have a scanning electronic microscopy that uh, uh, really focus on the surface of the specimen I am looking at, and transmission electron microscopy that focus that the beam of electrons pass through the specimen to study the internal structures of the cells. All right. But uh, one question, the cells is very, very small, right? Why are they small? Why most of the cells are small? Because they play a role. We have a uh, diffusion of substance in and out of the cell. So to play this, the, the, this is why they are very small. Some of the cells are really uh, relatively small due to the a uh, fact that the division of substance should be in and out of the cell. Cells should leave. And not only that, should communicate with the, uh, her external environment too. So they have diffusion that's coming in and out of the cell. So this is why the cells are small. And But this rate of division, diffusion, um, is affected by the surface area available, by the temperature, by the concentration gradient, by the distance and by the size of the substance that is diffused in. So let's look at this. Let's do some math for the cell size. I have the first cell and I have the second cell, all right? The surface area for the first one, it's six uh, millimeters square. The volume is one millimeter uh, cubic. And the surface area, which is the surface area per volume, it's, um, it's six. Millimeters minus one. <clears throat> for the second one, surface area is 24, the volume is 8, the surface area versus volume is 3. So as the size, cell size increase, its volume increase much more rapidly than its surface area. And the cells, why they do that? The cell, why the cells, uh, why the cells must have to a high surface area to volume rate? Why that? Why the cell should have high surface area to the volume rate? It's a very important to exchange at the surface because they are exchange at the surface area to maintain her internal stability, balance that we call homeostasis. So the cell must have a high surface area to volume ratio to maintain homeostasis. Look at this <clears throat> cell, cells. Look at the way to maintain high surface area to volume ratio. It's a small cells, but very large and slender nerve cells. <clears throat> so it must have high surface area to the volume ratio so it can maintain her own homeostasis, the intestinal microvillae, with those envaginations that play a role during the absorption. To maintain that, he have to have 
high surface area to the volume ratio. The microbial layer. The microbial layer over here, as you can see, increased the surface area available for absorption. So to do her job and maintain her homeostasis, which is her job is absorptions, you have to have this high surface area, those microvilli that increase her surface area. All right, so did you see that how important the cell must have a high surface area to the volume ratio? So we can maintain her job, her function that is directed to be doing to maintain her own homeostasis, her own internal balance. Now let's go back to the cells. <clears throat> uh, we have cells that they do have a nucleus, and we have some cells that does not have a nucleus. You already know that those cells that have a nucleus, we call them okaryotic cells. And the cells that has a nucleus, we call them prokaryotic cells, such as, such as bacteria and viruses. In another word, they do have a DNA, but their DNA is not inside of a nucleus. Remember what is what is what is the basic structure that all the cells of all living things share? You know that three things. Plasma membrane, DNA, ribosomes. This is what they all share. This is what I, me, myself, I share with bacteria and viruses. This is what you share with bacteria and viruses. All the cells of any living organism is made of three things. Plasma membrane, DNA, ribosomes. Okaryotic versus prokaryotics, the DNA exists inside of the nucleus, prokaryotic cells, neutral nucleus. So this is the biggest difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Also, their uh, other organelle for eukaryotic cells have a variety of membrane bounded. They have a membrane around them. This is why they look like compartment. It's like imagine yourself in a classroom and each student have her uh, his own table. You are sitting in this table. So each organelle inside of eukaryotic cells has a membrane around it. In the prokaryotic cells, no membrane bounded organelles exist. And they are very small, very, very small as compared as for eukaryotic cells. And they are produced by fission which is asexual reproductions. Prokaryotic cells, the cells are reproduced by asexually by mitosis, but we do have a special cells, we call that gamut, that reproduce uh, uh, by meiosis, which is the sexual reproductions. As an example for prokaryotic, we have bacteria and archaea. And for eukaryotic, we have a plant, fungi, protists, animals. So let's look at the strictures for bacteria. Look at this bacteria over here. This is prokaryotic. Why? I don't see a true nucleus. Did you see that the, the DNA that is filamentous on chromosome is localized in an area? It doesn't, he is like in the cytoplasm, but the area where it is, we call it Nucleoid. Nucleoid. Right? This ba the bacteria have a cell wall. And uh, by the way, this is what uh, we use actually as antibiotic is to destroy. Without the cell wall, we can destroy the bacteria. The, this is why some bacteria resist some antibiotics because we cannot destroy their cell well. 
of the bacteria. Once we write to destroy the cell wall, we can destroy this bacteria. So like, for example, penicillin, penicillin is to block an enzyme that will produce the cell wall. Without the cell wall, the bacteria will die. And around the cell wall, we have a capsule. And we have the cell membrane. Do you remember what I told you, all the living things which we share? Our cell doesn't have a cell wall. Cell wall does not. We don't have a cell wall. Cell wall exists only on some bacteria and also in the plant. We don't have. Animal does not have a cell wall. All right. So all which I share with this bacteria as a structures, I have DNA, I have plasma membrane, and they have some organelle over here, some ribosomes. This bacteria have a flagellum. Well, some of our men cells, the spermatozoid cells, does have a flagellum, all right? So let's explore animal cells. Versus plant cell. Animal cell versus plant cell. First of all, you are going to tell me, oh, Dr. Carver, uh, I can notice that animal cells are like round, circular, right? And the plant cells have like geometric form, right? It does. And we are going to look at these structures coming from outside to inside, coming from here and going in. I see, let's look at it together. This is animal. Let's look at what I'm, okay, come on. I this purple form, it's my nucleus. This is my nucleus. I told you from outside to inside, sorry. Let's go from here. Yeah, why am I coming to jump into this big structure? Let's jump from here. This is my plasma membrane. Huh, wait a minute, that's animal. Plant cell, does it have a pl uh, plasma membrane? Yeah, it does. That's my plasma membrane, not the green one. This is my. This is teeny, teeny thing over here that I'm going to In blue, that's my plasma membrane. That's my plasma membrane in this cut over here, and it's all around. That's a plasma membrane. Okay, so we're clear here. So let's look at the structure of this plasma membrane that exists in the plant as well as in the animal. Plasma membrane. What are the major constituents of the plasma membrane? The plasma membrane, it's a B layer. You see, it's one layer over here. And another layer over here of a phospholipid, which is the major constituent. That's a, this is why we call it phospholipid B layer. You remember our previous chapter about phospholipid, what we said about phospholipid. Phospholipid is made of phosphate group in the head, right? And they have two fatty acid. And this is what I told you we call like gentlemen with no hand. The two feet, imagine yourself that you are a phospholipid. Your head is the phosphate group, 
it's hydrophilic and your two feet are your fatty acid this is what is it phospholipid so this part it's hydrophilic it interacts with water but this part is lipidic it's hydrophobic it does not interact with water huh. so i have a part of my each molecule I have here, it interacts with water, and this part does not interact with water. And this is a B layer, and the only way to have this to be forming a B layer, B layer, is to have if to have this phospholipid in contact of another phospholipid. So I have to put immediately my two B layers of fatty acid, the fatty acid that constitute this phospholipid have to be in contact with each other because it will not be repelled by the hydrophilic parts of the phospholipid. So this is what made this phospholipid bilayer. Remember that 90% of the cell is made of water. So this is outside of the cell and this is inside of the cell that the intracellular intra space and this is the extracellular space. That's the extracellular space over here and that's inside of the cells over here. That's inside and that's extra. That's in uh, outside. Inside, outside. So this is the outside of the cell and this is intracellular part, extracellular part. And this is the two layer. This is one layer over here and this is another layer of phospholipid over here. You see, this is the major constituent of the plasma. All of it, this is a plasma membrane. All of it. All this. This is a plasma membrane. Okay? Major constituent is... So what I'm saying is 90% of the cell is made of water. That's mean outside is water and inside is also fluid, is also watery. So the only way to have this phospholipid B layer to have the part, the head part, remember that this is hydrophilic. This is hydrophilic. This is hydrophilic. This is hydrophilic. This is also hydrophilic. So all this hydrophilic part, this part, will be in contact of the outside that is watery. And this hydrophilic part of the other layer will be also in contact of the water that is in, in the inside of the cell. So the cell is within 90% of it is water. So it is outside is water and inside the water so the only way this phospholipid will be like this is to put the head that is hydrophilic in contact of water in both sides either outside and also inside what is left i love this two fatty acid this this fatty acid over here so they are going to be in contact with each other. So this will create hydrophobic parts over here. 
a sandwich of hydrophobic part. This is very, very hydrophobic is over here. All this part over here, it's hydrophilic, hydrophobic. But any part that is you see over here with this head, red, uh, brick, uh, orange color, that's hydrophilic. Okay, what else I saw? I saw also a lot of protein. Anything that you see there blue over here, this is proteins. This is a lot of proteins. Okay? And if you realize that they have some two type of proteins, we have some proteins that they are uh, channels proteins. And they have some protein, they are like a channels, you see? You know, like a channels, like... And we have integral proteins. And we have protein that exists only in one side. We call that peripheral proteins. You have to understand those protein. Remember, proteins, the monomer or the micromolecule that make the proteins are called amino acid. And you know that we have amino acid that they are hydrophilic that they have affinity to interact with water and you have uh, amino acid that they are hydrophobic they non-polar they cannot interact with the water so the way that they are those protein integral proteins this part that interact with the hydrophilic part for sure it's made of amino acid that they are water loving that they are hydrophilic in here and here but here This part over here, they must be made of amino acid, of this protein must be amino acid that they are hydrophobic. Because they are interacting with this fatty acid over here, that they are, if they are only, they are hydrophilic parts here, and this one is hydrophilic, they will be rejected. All right, and we have also hydrophilic part, the same thing. Here they have amino acid that this is hydrophilic, hydrophobic, sorry, and hydrophilic. The same over here, hydrophilic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Same things here, the same over here, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. What else we saw? We saw also some sugar. Those green stuff, they are carbohydrate. Those carbohydrates can be attached to the lipid, phospholipid immediately, directly, and we call that glycolipid, lipid with carbohydrate attached. Or they can attach to the proteins. We call that glycoprotein. The fact that the major constituent of this membrane is a phospholipids, which is a bilayer of phospholipid, and phospholipid is hydrophilic in the head, in the top, which is presented here by the orange head, and it's hydrophobic uh, in their fatty acid. Remember, phospholipid, how it is. Hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Right? It's a very selectively permeable. Can you believe that a single molecule of water cannot cross the membrane? He can cross, he can come here, it's the water, I'm coming, no problem. I interact with my head over here, it's hydrophilic. But the problem here I will be rejected by this part of the membrane. So a single molecule of water cannot cross the membrane. He has to have a channel to cross. We call that a protein channel or aquaporin, aquaporin, aqua for water. Single, I mean, sample um, non-polar molecules can cross. No, no problem if it's small. But if it's big, 
it has also to have a transporter protein because it will be rejected by the hydrophilic part. So the plasma membrane screen on what gets in and out of the cell. That's for the plasma membrane. Now we are going to go inside. Well, let's talk about the nucleus, this big purple one. The nucleus, also for plant cells, okay? Let's look at it, nucleus. It's covered by a double membrane. We call that envelope, nuclear envelope. nuclear envelope and what we have inside got it i have big scream of it so this is exactly what we have inside we have the nucleolus and they have chromatin and you see that they have a lot of holes in the nucleus this is what i call you see this i call that pore nuclear pore because I communicate with the rest of my cell, the rest organelle of the cell. And they do have my nuclear envelope that is made with double membrane. This is why I call it envelope. I have one membrane here and they have another membrane here. I have one membrane here and they have another membrane here. I remember a membrane is a B layer of phospholipid. So I have a B layer of phospholipid here, and they have another B layer of phospholipid here. So we have like a four layers of phospholipid. Wow. So this is what I call nuclear envelope. And the inside of the nucleus, I call it nucleoplasm. Nucleoplasm. Did you see those dots, those red dots? This is ribosomes. And you know where, where those ribosomes are made? They are made by the nucleolus. The nucleolus is where the ribosomes are sanitized, those red tiny things that you are seeing. And you're going to see it around all over. You can see them in the pore over here a lot or in the top of the uh, nuclear envelope. And the chromatin, what is it? The chromatin is, um, is actually uh, DNA plus protein, a lot of proteins. We call it chromatin. It's filamentous DNA chromosome plus protein. We call it chromatin. And the nucleolus, what is it? You see that chromatin? This is condensed, clustered region of the chromatin. This is where the ribosomes are sensitized. One thing that I want you to pay attention to it. You see how they communicate with the rest of the organelle? This one, it's a reticulum on the plasmic. And it communicates with the nucleus through this nuclear envelope. Did you realize that? It's in continuity. So the envelope nuclear go and continue, continuously connect with this other organelle that we call a reticulum on the plasmic. I will come back to that later on. So the nucleus, the function, contain most of the genetic information of the cell that is needed to carry out the cell's function and to produce a new cell, to produce because 
you remember the cell theory. One of the cell theory is that any new cells of form came from pre-existing cell. Where to carry this information? He carry it from the genetic material that exists in the nucleus. And the information, therefore, passed to daughter cells when the cell divides. I want now to focus on this uh, little dots over here, ribosomes. Let's look at their structures. Ribosome, their major function, you know what is it? It's to produce proteins. And they are synthesized where? In the nucleolus, which is a condensed region of the chromatin. Nucleolus. And chromatin, what is it? It's filamentous DNA plus proteins. So let's focus on the ribosome where the proteins are synthesized. There are two subunits. We have one large subunit, you see it? And small subunit. Large subunit and small subunit. You know what is the function? Is to produce and synthesize protein. We are going to see that in one of our last chapters with hydrogen expression. We are going to see the importance of the ribosome and how the ribosome assemble amino acid into proteins. The ribosome, I told you, is of the constituent that exists in all living organisms. We need plasma membrane, DNA, and ribosomes. So the DNA can carry her gene expression, can carry out the gene expression, her function, which is this is the genetic material. And you see it very well over here around, you see it around those reticulum endoplasmic, reticulum endoplasmic. Uh, did you remember when I told you how those, let me show you this slide, it's a beautiful slide, let me show it to you. Did you see how the nuclear envelope is in continuity with this reticulum endoplasmic? Well, we are going to focus actually on, because this is the nucleus uh, the nuclear envelope and this reticulum endoplasmic are part of what we call the endomembrane system. It's a system that uh, all operate together. They are either physically in contact with each other like the nuclear envelope with the endoplasmic reticulum or communicate with each other with the vesicles. Like for example, um, these strictures, you see how they communicate these strictures over here, which is, which is um, also reticulum endoplasmic, but it's smooth. I will come back to that. You see how they communicate with these two vesicles. And look at this, how they communicate with the plasma membrane. It through vesicles. There are no physical contacts between this orange one with this plasma membrane or this one with this one. It's just through vesicles. All right. So they are either in contact directly, physically, or via vesicles. Who are they? They are the plasma membrane, the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, the central vacuoles, and the lysosome. This is the part of all the membrane system. So let's focus on the endoplasmic reticulum. We have two types of endoplasmic reticulum. So let's look at them in the cells. So that's endoplasmic reticulum here in blue over here and the green over here. Green over here, not this one. I'm talking about this one and this one. This is endoplasmic reticulum. 
we have one the dr having and it's very nice in here in this picture on the plasmic reticulum that have those ribosome on the top they are coded with the ribosomes those are called rough on the plasmic reticulum rough on the plasmic reticulum this is the one that have a lot of dots over here if you really zoom in it this is the rough on the plasmic reticulum those over here doesn't have those that those ribosome they are not coded they lack the presence of ribosome we call them smooth on the plasmic reticulum smooth on the plasmic reticulum rough on the plasmic you have those ribosome on the top on their surface and the one that they lack you see it doesn't have those ribosome on the surface we call that smooth on the plasmic reticulum to abbreviate we call it er smooth er rough er one has ribosomes in their surface and one lack the ribosome on the surface that's the structure the function is also different the rough on the plasmic reticulum they are involved on the synthesis of protein the smooth er they don't synthesize protein they are involved on the synthesized lipids steroids muscle contractions but also cell doxifications where we find them most in the liver the smooth er you know when somebody is a drinker he drink alcohol the first organ that shut off what is it the liver exactly because the liver have a lot of smooth on the plasmic reticulum on it to detoxify the body against the alcohol that this person is drinking. So imagine that this person is a drunker. You see how much this liver is going to work to detoxify the body at the point that in the end, he cannot do it anymore. So the first, this is where the first organ that shut off when somebody is a drinker is the liver. Next, we're going to talk about the Golgi apparatus. I love the Golgi. Look at, let's look at where the Golgi is. Is this one that have this end like a spoon? It's here, over here also. Golgi apparatus. The Golgi have two sides. Have a side that will face, you see it over here? Have a side that will face down the plasmic reticulum and have a side that face the plasma membrane. This we call it this face, the one that face the on the plasmic reticulum or face the nucleus we call it sixth phase the one that is the other side the opposite it facing the plasma membrane we call it trans phase what is the job for the the reticulum on uh, apparatus i mean the golgi apparatus look at the electronic microscopy for it it's beautiful that's this and that's the trans that's the cis and that's the trans the cis is the one that we receive a physical remember down the plasmic setup uh, the system they are either communicating continuously or by physical so the golgi we receive physical coming from where coming from the endoplasmic reticulum either smooth or rough you will send and communicate with the golgi through the cis phase you will receive those physicals those physicals contain either proteins or contain lipids if this is smooth and he will go through the, this, the, 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 the Golgi apparatus and they will modify that he will become mature protein will become mature lipids 
and then he will send it in the other phase, which is the trans phase. And he go wherever the cell needed. If plasma membrane need a protein, when he go to the plasma membrane. If some other lysosome, for example, need a protein, we go to the lysosome. Okay? So this is why we call Golgi apart is like a post office. He receive and ship. Receive, put a stamp, making it looking mature, and send it. It's a, uh, it's a post office. Receive, modified, store, and ship products of the endoplasmic reticulum. I'm going to tell you some things. Those organelles interact only with each other. The Golgi apparatus here will not work with the mitochondria or, or peroxisome. Mitochondria is not part, or chloroplast, if this is plant, because it's not part of the endoplasmic uh, system. It will work only between them. Those, you remember the list that I told you? This is how they work with each other. They communicate either continuously or by vesicles. Plasma membrane, the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi, the central vacuum lysosome, that's it. Any other organ that is outside of the endomembrane system, they will not work with it. So the vesicles that they are coming from the Golgi will not go to those that they are not part of the endomembrane system. I'm making myself clear, please. All right. So now let's talk about lysosome and vesicles. Those vesicles over here and lysosome. They are uh, membrane bonded organelles and they are coming from Golgi, right? Those big pictures over here. The lysosome, the, the are lysosomes. Lys mean cat. So they are breaking down macromolecules. Most of it are digestive vesicles. For example, you are eating. Um, uh, you are eating. So they are uh, this big vacuole will completely take uh, vacuum. We call it vacuole food. So the lysosome will combine with this vacuole food to break down this food and produce whatever the cell need. If it's need amino acid, if it's need uh, sugar, whatever. And also, not only that not only breaking down uh, big uh, molecules of food, but also destroy cells that they are uh, uh, foreign uh, by what we call, uh, that the cells by, by mistake has engulfed by phagocytosis. And, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, they can also destroy some other uh, organelle that they are too much for the cell, if the cell producing too much mitochondria, for example, where do you lose the cam and cut? Okay, that's too much mitochondria. This may destroy you. And those uh, vesicles are transport organelles. They are uh, organelles that play a role as transport, the vesicles. The lysosome, they do more than that. They break down, they protect the cells against foreign matter. Uh, that engloff, uh, that has been engloffed by the cells by a phenomenon that we call phagocytosis. So this is really very simple. This is uh, formation and function. Uh, I mean, look at that. There's the nucleus. It's in continuity with the ribonucleic acid, uh, with endoplasmic reticulum, sorry, or rough. Right, and this is the smooth. They are secreting uh, transport vesicles. The vesicles are going to communicate by the cisphase of the Golgi. They are going to be modified in the Golgi, going through blah, 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 etc., etc. We are beautiful. Then the protein are going to be in secretory uh, vesicles, and there's the secretory uh, travel all the way until it becomes in contact. This is in in case of the travel to the plasma membrane releasing the contact outside of the cell environment, if this is, I mean, need to be transported outside of the cell, but sometimes you will stay in the cell membrane or sometimes inside any organelle that is a part of on the membrane system needed. Okay. So 
So let's look at this. So we talk about the plasma membrane, plasma membrane, both in animals and plants. It's the same thing. Around uh, on the plasma, rough on the plasmic ER. The rough on the plasmic ER. Smooth ER, smooth ER, Golgi, Golgi, also in animals. Nucleus, nucleus, all right? On the plasmic, uh, on the plasmic system, on the plasmic system, which is the uh, a nuclear envelope that is in continuity with the rough or smooth ER. The Golgi, they are in contact via vesicles, and the plasma membrane. Lysosomes, lysosomes, all right. Now we are going to talk about the structure that is only exists in the plant cells. This is structure, this organelle is this big vacuole that you are seeing here. You don't see it in the animal cells. You see it only in the plant cells. Vacuole. Central vacuole. What's the job of central vacuole? If you see it, it's just a vacuole, and it has um, it's it helps the cell to elongate. It accumulates water, and it stores also ions, organic compound, water, soluble pigment the central vacuole. Now we are going to talk about the other structures that they are not part of the endomembrane system. One of them is the peroxisome. Peroxisome, the job of it is to generate hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen peroxide is broken by an hydrogen peroxidase which is a catalyze and then sometimes this uh, catalyze this hydrogen peroxidase forms a crystal within the peroxidum and because it generate this Hydrogen um, uh, peroxidase the liver and the kidney has to generate those hydrogen peroxidase to destroy this hydrogen peroxide to catalyze it into water and oxygen. And this is why we have those catalyzed because um, the peroxidome, what is it? It oxidizes amino acid and fatty acid that will generate those hydrogen peroxide. And the liver will secrete this enzyme that will destroy, will catalyze this hydrogen peroxidase that has been generated by amino acid and fatty acid. I repeat, this peroxide does, is not part of the endomembrane system. Mitochondria. Hmm. The major function of the mitochondria is a factory of uh, ATP. This is where the ATP, adenosine 3-phosphate, is being produced. And you know what is ATP. Adenosine 3-phosphate is an adenosine, nitrogen is base plus three phosphate group. It's very energetic. It's the energy, it's the currency that the cell uses as energy to do the job. So we need mitochondria. It's very important to have the mitochondria because this is the power for the cell. It's the one that will give the energy for the cell to do the job. By what? By producing ATP. Structure of the mitochondria. Very funny. The mitochondria exists both in both animals and plants. The mitochondria is made of 
the ribosomes. But the funny part is we do have DNA, mitochondrial DNA. DNA exists only in the nucleus, but in the mitochondria, we do have a DNA. And we have a double membrane. This is why we call it envelope, mitochondrial envelope. We have an outer membrane that is will be in contact with the cytoplasm, and we have an inner membrane that will be in contact with what we call the inside of the mitochondria. We call that the matrix. And those invaginations over here, we call that crista. Crista. That's crista. Crista. It's the invagination of the inner membrane. Crista. Or cristae. So we have mitochondrial DNA. We have a lot of ribosomes, mitochondrial ribosomes. It's very funny. This is like, um, for example, if this envelope need a protein, you know, from where they get the protein from her own ribosomes or the cytoplasmic ribosome, but never with the cytoplasm. Uh, with the ribosome that exists in the top of the uh, coat with the endoplasmic reticulum. And it has her own DNA. That means it's like a uh, semi-independent. It's not, it's not completely depend, uh, independent, but it's like semi-independent because it produces her own proteins. He does her own gene expression. So this is an electronic microscopy of the mitochondria. So you can see the crystal. So this is the uh, uh, membrane. And that's the outer membrane. And that's the cytoplasm over here. And inside, that's the mitochondrial matrix. And it is the factory for ATP. And ATP is the currency that the cells is the currency. It's the, you know, the currency that we use in the United States dollar, right? To buy anything so we can survive, right? So the cells to survive use a currency that is ATP, adenosine three phosphate. And most, and this is produced through a cellular respiration, which will be a subject for another chapter. We call that cellular respiration. It happened here in this mitochondria and exists both in the animal as well as in the plant. So let's um, look at both these pancreatic cells. So we have, if I give you this histology and I ask you, okay, can you recognize the structures? All right, yeah, okay. I know that this big thing over here, it's my nucleus. This is my nucleolus. And over here, this is my chromatin. And this is my, the, um, the, this fence around, that's the plasma membrane. And all this, all this, this is my cytoplasm. All right, so this is my smooth rondoplasmic reticulum. That's the Golgi. All these little dots over here, that's the ribosomes. That's the mitochondria. And the pancreas is an animal cell. So I'm not looking for other like cell vacuoles or uh, chloroplast or cell wall. That's very typical for plant cells. And those granules, they are just zymogen granules. This is just a vesicles. If you put me just this is a vesicles, that's a vesicles to store. Um, uh, inactive ordinary precursor or procolytic uh, enzyme. Uh, the pancreas, uh, very, very rich in on, on, on enzymatic um, molecule. And this, oh, that's the smooth, and that's this over here, that's the rough on the plasma reticulum with the ribosomes in the top, code ribosomes. All right. So let's see. So we finish plasma membrane, plasma membrane.
rough on the plasmic reticulum, rough on the plasmic reticulums, nucleus, nucleus, envelope, nuclear, envelope, nuclear, nucleolus, nucleolus, chromatin, chromatin, mitochondria, mitochondria, Golgi with vesicles, Golgi with vesicles. What else I said? Also, central vacuole. We don't have it in animal cells. I have this. Doesn't exist in animal cells. Did you notice that? That's what we call chloroplast. Chloroplast is present only in the cell of plant and some other eukaryotic cells, but not animals. It contains chloroplast contain um, chlorophyll, these green things. It is very important for photosynthesis. And when we study the photosynthesis um, that is being done by plants, we will talk about those chloroplasts. What we give to a plant, light and water, and we take the light and the water, and they produce an organic molecule such as molecule of sugar and oxygen. Anyway, so let's look at the structures of chloroplasts. It's on toward by surrounded by two membrane, one membrane, which is the inner mitochondrial membrane, and the outer membrane, right? An envelope also. And between them is the intermembrane space external or outer membrane, inner or internal membrane, and the internal membrane space between the two membranes. This is an envelope. This will make an envelope. With, uh, I mean, chloroplastic envelope or envelope of the... Inside, inside we call it stroma. Remember the mitochondria inside what you call it? Matrix. Here is the stroma. And what is inside? What did you see? The DNA. It also has her own DNA. Isn't that funny? It has her own DNA. It's beautiful. And look at that. They have also some ribosomes. Some ribosomes. And the most important, which we have, I always call it mint chocolate. I don't know why. The mint for green and chocolate. It's what we called telacoid. It's one, it's a telacoid. This is one telacoid, two telacoid, third telacoid, another telacoid. Look at this over here. One, two, three, four, five telacoid together. More than two telacoid together, we call them granum. And the telacoid have a membrane. We call that telacoid membrane and have a space that we call telacoid space or men. So the granum, it's an assemblage of telacoid. And telacoid, what are they? They are membranous sac within the inner membrane. And the way that was, um, uh, it's very funny, the way they, they are reproduced, those um, chloroplasts, even mitochondria, they are divided by binary fission. And you know who divide by binary fission? It's the bacteria, the prokaryotic cells. They look like little prokaryotic cells inside of an eukaryotic cell. This is why the endobiotic uh, theory came, came in. They postulate, this theory postulates that chloroplasts and mitochondria used to be prokaryotic cells that become corrupt and evolve within an eukaryotic cells. Why? Because they have a DNA plasmic 
DNA and ribosome. But a science recently discovered that this DNA, it's not bacterial DNA. But still, we use this endosymbiotic theory because the size is very small, as small as bacteria. But this DNA is not bacterial DNA. That's the science that discovered that recently. And divide by binary fission. So this is the only reason why we use the endosymbiotic theory mean. Now, let's talk about another. Let's see how we explore. We explore everything, right? We explore the peroxisome. We explore the vacuole, central vacuole for the plant. We explore the chloroplast for the plant. Golgi, we explore everything. What is left is the cytoskeleton. Those, those structures over here. This is cytoskeleton. Those structures over here. Cytoskeletons, what are they? They are proteins, they are a system of protein that will give the skeleton for the cell. This is why we call it cytoskeleton. Cyto for cell, skeleton, the skeleton of the cell. This is the one that will give the shape, maintain the shape of the cell. They are favored that they are crisscross, the cytoplasm providing structure support and shape the cell and in some cases even move the cell so play a role in um, locomotion the compound of the cytoskeleton we have the microtubules we have the microfilaments and we have the intermediate filament they are all playing a role on maintaining the shape of the cell the microtubules The major function of the microtubule is to move or to separate the chromosome there in the cell division, rotate that. That's one of the major functions of the microtubules. The microfilaments also maintain the, 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 the cell shape, they do. But they will do the what we call the pseudopod movement of the cell, and they will control and mediate the movement of the cytoplasm. Uh, that things that we saw in the plant cells, we call that cytoplasmic streaming. The intermediate filament, they are uh, between, their size is between microtubules and microfilaments. Microfilaments are the smallest one, the thinnest compound. The, the bigger, the thickest uh, compound is microtubules. The thinnest uh, one is the microfilament. And the intermediate filament is between the microtubules and microfilament. They are uh, in the middle uh, uh, range and they are very, very well branched. And their job is to help encore the organelle, making sure that when the cell moves, it moves entirely with her own organelle attached to it. The intermediate filament do that. But also, they are the one that will make this, um, we call it nuclear environment. We call that nuclear lamina. Each nuclear have a, 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 her own um, space. So the one that create this space, we call that lamina, nuclear lamina, is the intermediate filament. So we have the biggest one are the microtubules, the intermediate filament, and the microfilament. Microtubules, this sector. I want 
to go back to the animal cells because I see it so well. I want to go back over here. I want you to focus on these microtubules that they are green over here. Cahoos, you know, the one that we use to water our plant. All right. And they are over here, here too. <clears throat> Did you see those two pair? This is what we call centrosome. And the centrosome in the animal cells is made of pair of centriole. We have a centrosome too in the plant cells, but does not have this pair, you don't see this pair of centriole in the plant, it does not have a centriole. Okay, so let's look at the compositions of the microtubules. Microtubules form the pair of centriole in the animal cells. And if you look at this centriole, they are triplets. Nine by it's nine. One, two, three tubule, microtubules. One, two, three microtubules. Nine times. So it's an arrangement of nine multiplied by three arrangements of microtubules. This is what is this a pair of perpendicular microtubules that you, I mean centriole that you see in the animal cells. They form the centriole in animal cells. The microtubules. The microtubules they are exist in the plant. But they don't form a pair of centriole. They don't. We don't have centriole in animal cells. And they facilitate the vesicle transport because they are always attached by a protein, motor protein, like a kinesin protein over here. They are always attached to it. And we have them also, you know, the cells and flagella, they move because they are made of uh, microtubules too. And the only difference that you see between the centriole and the microt, uh, the centriole and the cilia and the flagella, it's look at it. It's this arrangement of microtubules. In the centriole, you have a triplet nine times. Here you have nine times only duplet. And you have a central pair of uh, microtubules in the center for the cilia and flagella. So you have one, two, three, you have nine, but it's a doublet of microtubule one and two. In the centrioles, you have a triplet and you have a pair of some uh, microtubules in the center. You have this pair of microtubules for the centriole. And of course, um, flagella are very long, and very thick, and the cell, dated cells are very, usually cells have one or two flagella. I mean, but uh, cells can have more, a lot of, they are very numerous, uh, the, the seal, the seal, the, the cell can be a lot of seals around and they are very thin and short. But both of them, flagella and cell, are made of microtubules. But the microtubules for cell and flagella, they are nine multiplied by two arrangements of microtubule plus one pair in the center. For the centrioles, no. If you remember, the centrioles is nine by three arrangements of microtubules. Okay. And also the microtubules, one important thing is that play a role there in the uh, separations because it facilitates this uh, movement. Uh, of the separation of the chromosomes they're in the cell division so when the chromosome if we uh, we stop we uh, we block the microtubules by using some drugs like van balizin for example we can stop the cell to be uh, separated so therefore the cell died all right and this is a lot of thing, time we use it as um, um kill with during the chemotherapy to kill the tumoral cells and to kill the tumoral cells we target their microtubules and when we block the microtubules the cell can no longer separate it because it can no longer get separated the chromosome during the cell division all right microfilament as i said help maintain and change the cell shape like a pseudopod movement a pseudopod movement i mean it's a movement that some cells do 
it's still attached to support and you move without going away from the support it's still attached it's just like he he is attached to one side and then he reached to the other side why it's a pseudopod movement and also uh cycloses like a stoplasmic streaming and happen a lot for the plant cell uh, this is also to distribute the, 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 the cytoplasm move around. The, if you see it over here, the central vacuole, that's the plant cells. It happened only in the plant cell. This happened in the animal cells, the pseudopod uh, movement. And this for the animal cell, plant cells. If you see it, the cytoplasm move to distribute either water and some ions and needs for the other part to reach all the parts of this. And as I said, intermediate to a filament help anchor, attach the organelle, but also form this uh, lamina, this environment around that exists very, very simple to exist around the nucleus, lamina. Now we are going to talk about an extracellular structure. So let's look at the extracellular, just me and you right now, very naively. We are going to look at both those cells. We are going to talk about the extra cellular part that exists outside of the cell. Outside. Outside of the cell for the plant, I can see it. It's a cell wall, the green part. The cell wall exists in the plant and some uh, bacteria. It doesn't exist in the animal cells. And you remember the major constituent of the cell wall, what is it? We talk about it in the previous chapter. is a polymer. It's a cellulose that is made only of glycose. It's a virus a polysaccharide. And this is what we make. We, we distinct uh, the bacteria from gram positive to gram negative. So if you study microbiology, it will come back because some bacteria following the various polysaccharide that exists on their cell wall can be gram positive or gram negative for the plant fungi their uh, fungi it's called kitten uh, and most algae this is where the this uh, cell wall exists it play a role as uh, support it give uh, rigidity to the cell, it protect really, really very well the cell. Very important, especially for example, they're in the process what we call the movement of the water. You see, an animal cells, if you give it too much water, it can explode and die, right? Because it doesn't have a cell wall to protect it against the uptake of the water. But it's raining outside. Can you imagine if those plant cells does have a cell wall? What's going to happen? They will die when it's raining too much. And the only reason that you don't die, you don't expose like animal cells, it's because the presence of the cell wall that will protect the cell against the uptake of water. And we have a hole in the cell wall. We call that plasmodesmata. They communicate, one cell communicates with another cell through the plasmodesmata. Now we are going to talk about the animal cells. That's the only extra structures for the plant cells. It is the presence of the cell wall. It doesn't exist for animal cells. For the animal cells, what are those extra structures? We call that ECM, extracellular matrix. You don't have a cell wall, but you have mixture of um, glycoprotein around them in this space. We have a collagen fiber. We have a fibronectin. And we have this proteoglycan complex, which is a protein with the carbohydrate, which is the one that is uh, purple over here, polysaccharide. Protein. Oh, sorry, they make the protein, uh, the carbohydrate with the protein and the polysaccharide. 
we call that proteoglycan complex. It's protein plus a lot of sugar around it. And the extracellular matrix a form a protective layer also over the cell surface. And can you believe that this ACM communicates with the inside of the cell? It does. Through what? Through those proteins. Some, some extracellular matrix have a receptor for it. Antigrin, for example, protein. It band to a fibronectin. So let's recapitulate. Animal cells, summary. We have a nucleus, nuclear envelope, chromatin nucleolus is in continuity with ribonuclease on the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. That's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We have the Golgi apparatus. We have the lysosome that digests food and also protects against any foreign um, bacteria or any foreign uh, organism or anything that came uh, by on phagocytosis inside of the cell. We have the mitochondria that produces the power of the cell, that produces energy because it produces ATP, which is the currency used by the cell to do the job. We have small vacuoles time to time, but we don't have a central vacuoles. We have peroxidomes that metabolize the waste. We have the smooth endoplasmic reticulums that makes lipids. Liver is very rich on the smooth reticulum endoplasmic. We have the microtubules that form the mitotetic samples and maintain the shell shape. It make the, the mitotic samples uh, spindles that will separate the chromosome during the cell divisions. All right, we have the centrosome that is made of pair of centriole. And a pair of centriole is actually made by microtubules with arrangements of nine, which divided by three. We have the intermediate filament that hold organelle in place. And we have the microfilament that form the cellular cortex and the plasma membrane. And of course, outside we have the ECM, which is the extracellular matrix. The plant cells, we have the cell wall that protect the cell and give rigidity to the cell. We have also, of course, the cell membrane. We have ribosomes. We have the reticulum endoplasmic rough and smooth. We have also the mitochondria and we have the, on, the chloroplasts. We do have peroxisome. We have what we call plastids, which store pigment. We don't have lysosomes. We have the cytoskeleton, which is microtubules and immediate filaments and microfilaments. And the nucleus with the nucleolus chromatin, of course. And we have the most important central vacuoles. So I really want you to do as a practice is to take those slides and try to make a legend so you can get familiar with those structures. So here, for example, immediately you know that this is Golgi apparatus, all right? mitochondria, central vacuoles, nucleolus, chromatin, all right? and this is the this is a plant, just by looking at the structure, it's very geometric, rectangular though, so this is a plant cells. And because also it has this chloroplast over here. That's a Golgi on five. That's a central vacuoles. That's a central vacuole membrane. That's a 
plasm and that's also cytoplasm and this is mitochondria. And I want you to also to train yourself about the next slide, the last one, which is uh, animal cells. This animal cells, it seems like it's an intestinal cells because I can see some villi over here. This is a microvilli. And also some ciliated, huh? Not very funny. It's not only you have ciliated cells. This is mitochondria. Oh, this is my somprosome. I cannot, I can see only one centriole. Usually it's a pair of centriole. This is my rough on the plasmic reticulum with a lot of ribosome on it. This is also ribosome. That's a vesicle that has been um, taken out by exocytosis. This is a vesicle. This is smooth reticulum on the plasmic because I don't see any ribosome on it. That nucleolus. That's a pore, nuclear pore. And this is all of it, that's a nucleoplasm. And that's an envelope nuclear. That's a pore nuclear. And that's chromatin. And number 13. All right, that's and our um, That's end our chapter for today. We will see you um, for the next um, um, lecture. Uh, stay safe and healthy, and please, please do not hesitate to comment. If you have any questions, I will answer to it. Thank you so much, and have a good day.